Hello and welcome back everyone to the second day of our workshop towards the future of environmental health sciences. Um, this workshop is being sponsored by the Standing Committee on the Use of Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decisions and um, the goal of this workshop is to gather numerous voices from around the scientific and practice community to better understand how we can envision the role of environmental health sciences in advancing um, the work and protecting human health far into the future. So it seems a little abstract, and yet we're asking people to really think towards the future as a goal of redesigning and re-evaluating our priorities in addressing environmental threats to human health here. We had a very dynamic day yesterday, and one of the goals of this particular workshop, as the Standing Committee has been envisioning the future and, and addressing these challenges over the last year, is to really bring in a large number of voices from the broader community. So with that in mind, I think we could, um, there's a questionnaire that's at the bottom of those uh, folks who are here. There's a questionnaire that we would love to hear voices from other folks, but some of the questions that we heard from the public to date um, that we would like to address include some of the challenges that we were talking about yesterday. So what is the health or societal challenge that you believe advances environmental health sciences, and how can environmental health sciences address this over the next decade? Um, can you name two environmental health research topics that she, should be prioritized in the next five years? What are those extrinsic factors, such as environmental exposures, lifestyle, and social determinants of health that contribute heavily to the development of a vast number of diseases? And what do you think is one barrier to fully integrate environmental health, public health, biomedical, disease-specific, and prevention research so that we can improve health for all? Answering these questions is challenging. It's the crux of why we're here today. It's also why we're using this envisioning perspective to look towards the future to be, better understand how we can address these challenging questions. So thank you to the public for raising those um, and to the audience. So anyone else in the audience, we do have a button at the bottom of the screen, both for providing questions for the panelists to respond to throughout the day, as well as for you to ask some of those big overarching questions to us um, as well. And we'll try to address some of those at the end of the morning this morning in our final session and wrap up. So without any further ado, I really would like to thank our next panelists. We have a, a wonderful panelists and sets of speakers from leaders from across the National Institute of Health who will be talking broadly about how environmental health sciences can advance the work that they do within their agencies. So we've asked to talk about what does the future of environmental health sciences look like? How might we think about expanded mental models to address this? And then um, what scientific advances are needed to achieve these goals? So um, with that, I'm going to pass things on to Dr. Gary Miller, and thanks to everyone for joining us this morning. I look forward to a very exciting discussion. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, I'm Gary Miller at Columbia University, um, and I was on the planning committee, and I'm also on the standing committee uh, for uh, emerging science for environmental health decisions. So today we have the pleasure of having representatives from four different NIH institutes to talk about the future of environmental health sciences. Um, for the purpose of today's discussion, I think we should think about the environment in two ways. One is the more holistic view of the environment being everything that is non-genetic, kind of the big definition. This would include chemical exposures, social determinants of health, dietary factors, pathogens, all of it. And then second, we also have to consider it in the way that NIH and NIEHS have classically defined it, as more the non-volitional exposures, thinking about chemical exposures, uh, secondhand smoke, but not things like dietary factors or smoking or alcohol consumption. Um, so again, I think that we want to look at it in both ways, but for the standpoint of the big definition, I think that all of the NIH institutes work in that realm. But when you get into more of the specific, more focused definition, we see some differences there. Um, so with that, I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Rick Wycheck. He is the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. Um, he has been with the Institute for many years as deputy director. Before that, he was at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, his background is in genetics, and it's very nice to see that he's taken a key leadership role on the environmental side. So with that, Dr. Wycheck. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> yes. Always good to know the microphone is working. So thanks, Gary. So let me start off by thanking the committee for their work to coordinate this workshop. It's really important that we have this opportunity to look to the future. 
And as we look to the future, it's, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And what's clear from the presentations that we've all heard thus far, there are many things that we need to keep in mind. So therefore, what I thought I would do is spend the 15 minutes that are assigned to me to focus on a few topics that have been under discussion at NIHS over the past couple of years since I've been the director. So let's go to the next slide, please. So first and foremost, with the increasing recognition that environmental exposures play a critically important role in human health and disease, and as we plan for the future, those of us in the environmental health sciences community must embrace the opportunities to collaborate with others studying the etiology of human disease. So other organizations, including those, uh, the, say the NCI, the National Institute of Aging, the National Institute of Nursing Research, you're going to hear more about those in just a few minutes, as well as a broad base of other organizations that are studying, again, the etiology of human disease, I mean, they can all bring complementary and powerful capabilities to better understand the biological mechanisms that underlie health and disease. And uh, as we discussed earlier in the meeting, uh, these collaborations need to extend beyond just the usual suspects, uh, and they need to include those investigators working on the social determinants of health. And furthermore, we also need to be very purposeful in how we engage with communities in the research that we conduct. So lots of different things to keep in mind. Next slide. So again, in the limited time that I have, I want to focus on uh, some specific research programs that have been kind of in the, in the focus over the past couple of years. And the first program that I want to describe is one we heard a bit about yesterday. But I first learned about this when Cheryl Walker and Andrea Baccarelli and Dana Dole and I described the concept of precision environmental health, and they did this at a recent uh, NIEHS council. So best I can tell, this program is all about recognizing that individuals respond to environmental exposures in different ways. So some of these differential responses will be due to the underlying genetic differences between individuals. But it also includes, it's not just genetics, uh, it also includes the epigenetic and other biological variabilities that can arise uh, that make us all uniquely ourselves, our unique human beings. And we also need to recognize that uh, some of these biological variations or epigenetic changes can occur as a consequence of exposures during development. So the program uh, the uh, Precision Environmental Health, uh, I think nicely dovetails with the Precision Medicine Program, which is connected with the All of Us 1 Million Person Cohort at the NIH. And it also connects well with the programs across the globe that are collaborating as part of the, what's come to be referred to as the International Common Disease Alliance or the ICDA. So I think in the end, this is all about uh, trying to identify the genetic, the genomic, and the biological signals that regulate how genes are being expressed and how those changes in gene expression can confer different phenotypes that either promote health or cause disease. So as Shell Walker puts it, um, precision environmental health is about working at the intersection of genetics uh, and environmental health, as well as data science, all focused on the purpose of studying gene by environment interactions. So next slide, please. And I also want to focus, it's about preventing disease. So the, the next program I want to talk about is, oh, I'm sorry, go back to the previous slide, I'm not quite done yet. Uh, and also coupled with the precision environmental health is this concept uh, of the exposome framework that we need to be uh, employing to collect exposure data. And I think as we have all come to recognize in the environmental health sciences community, the exposome is about the totality of exposures over a lifetime. So the exposome concept recognizes that if we, we truly want to understand the impact of the environment on human health, we have to develop a research strategy that moves beyond studying single exposures. And it needs to include the windows of exposure over a life course, especially during development. So the environmental health sciences community has been discussing the, uh, the exposome concept since 2005 when Wilde originally proposed the concept. But what's been lacking is a clear experimental design of how to conduct an experiment in exposomics. So we need to define what data needs to be collected to conduct an exposomics experiment. So therefore, uh, you know that we're working together with Gary Miller and many of his colleagues, uh, NIHS will be sponsoring a set of five virtual workshops over the coming months that will culminate in an in-person workshop in 
September at NIEHS. And the purpose of these workshops will be to really work out with the global environmental health sciences community to define how do we operationalize exposomics. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the second program that's been kind of in focus that we've been spending a lot of time talking about is the Climate Change and Health Program. So soon after the inauguration in January of 2021, as I think we all realize, it's uh, the Biden administration is putting climate change as a major focus of its effort. So the president issued a executive order 14008, which amongst many other things creates the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity in HHS. So the executive officer, uh, the, the executive order also uh, specifies that the NIH needs to take on the challenge of addressing the health related issues associated with climate change. So while NIHS has been one of the leading ICs funding climate change and health research over the past 10 years, it just was abundantly clear that studying the health consequences of climate change is much bigger than what one IC can accomplish on, on its own. So therefore, I've taken the initiative to reach out to six other IC directors, which includes Dr. Zeng, who will be uh, speaking in just a few minutes. And we've uh, self-formed, uh, coalesced into form what we're calling the Executive Committee for Climate Change and Health. So together, we've re-energized a working group with membership from across the NIH. And we are now at a point where we have developed a strategic framework for climate change and health at the NIH. Again, this is an NIH-wide program. So this framework is based on four different core elements that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, which includes health effects research, health equity, training and capacity building, and intervention science. Now, at the center is a focus on multidisciplinary transformative research, and the work will be conducted with global cross-sector interagency and community partnerships. And the cogs around this, the, uh, the periphery of this diagram represent elements well, a broad assortment of different types of research that will be necessary to support the framework. And these range from basic mechanistic research to behavioral and social science research, epidemiology, and predictive modeling, uh, all the way to adaptation research. So I encourage you, if you're interested, uh, visit the website that we've developed. It's www.nih.gov forward slash climate and health. You can see that in the lower right-hand corner of the, the diagram. And I should add that Dr. Hodes and Dr. Sharpless um, have expressed an interest in continuing to work with us uh, in planning this, uh, planning the future of this NIH-wide climate change and health program. So thank you, Richard, uh, for your, your efforts. Next slide, please. So another big area of focus at NIHS has, has been around uh, mechanistic and translational toxicology. So our division of the National Toxicology Program has undergone a major transformation over the past couple of years under the leadership of Dr. Barich. So the DNTP is increasingly interested in developing a research platform that produces results that can be seamlessly translated to predict adverse health effects in human populations. The DNTP is focused on the kind of uh, the innovative research that will move toxicology to become a more predictive science. So we don't have time to discuss all the areas of progress, but suffice it to say, there are many, many different noteworthy areas of innovation. Some of them are illustrated on the right-hand side of this, this diagram. I mean, one of them includes the development of sophisticated computational approaches using artificial intelligence and machine learning to leverage existing data sets that the NTP has been collecting over the last several decades. And these range from gene expression profiles to digitized pathology images. Another example relates to innovative new strategies involving the use of in vitro pipelines with uh, human IPSCs uh, that are differentiated to form complex 3D modeling systems. And Brian and his colleagues uh, assume that these will enhance our ability to identify and characterize potential, say, for example, cardiovascular hazards related to environmental exposures. I mean, a third area of innovation is the use of genetic diversity to study the toxicity of different environmental agents. Uh, they've used the diversity outbreak population based model from the Jackson Laboratory to study the influence of high fat diet. And they're also creating embryonic stem cell populations from the diversity outbred mice to study toxicodynamic variability factors in, uh, for example, the neuroprogenitor stem cell uh, system. So working on mechanisms associated, associated with toxicity during neural development. So next slide. 
And I also want to just comment very briefly here. Uh, another recent area of focus has been better understanding how do we address the issues of social justice and health disparities. And as many of you know, NIHS has a long history of studying environmental justice, EJ, and we've recently developed a cross-divisional planning team to begin to explore how we might develop research strategies to address health disparities that build on our past accomplishments. So we've done a lot in the past, but we need to do more. The planning group hosted a workshop on environmental justice and health disparities several weeks ago. They brought together members of the environmental justice communities, including those close to Superfund sites in our own backyard in Central North Carolina, and some of those located uh, next to those large hog farming operations we talked about yesterday uh, in Eastern North Carolina. So it was very interesting bringing these community members in. We received an earful from these community members. I mean, they understand that we do research and it's important to do the research, but I think they're also tired of, of coming to us and describing their problems. They want their neighborhoods to be cleaned up. They want something to be done. And as Dr. Wright indicated yesterday in his comments, uh, the issues with these communities are complicated because many members of these communities are employed by the business operations that are contributing to the environmental problems. So it's complicated. So the working group is now working on strategies. How do we figure out how we can bring the capabilities in the environmental health sciences research community together and to address the needs of these environmental justice communities? So stay tuned and more workshops will be on the way and we encourage you to participate. So I think uh, hopefully this just gives you a little idea of some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, so Gary, I'm gonna turn the virtual podium back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Wychik. Um, so I would like to remind the audience members to post questions in the Q&A box that we'll come to at the end after all the discussion. Um, so next we have Dr. Richard Hodes, who is the director of the National Institute of Aging. Uh, I can't recall a time when he wasn't the director of the National Institute of Aging. And if you look back since he's uh, been leader since 1993, uh, the Institute just had extraordinary growth and impact, and it's very exciting to see the work that they've been doing. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Otis. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate. Uh, reflecting, as Rick has noted, uh, our Institute's commitment and, and an appreciation of our partnership with all of you. But I'd like to focus a bit on the areas and domains of this important field that are particularly related to National Institute on Aging and the fate of older adults as a result of environmental exposures. The next slide, please. The one illustration of the uh, particular disproportionate effect of exposures and climate change is that reflected here in this uh, Lancet countdown report, which identified older adults as a particular vulnerable population experiencing uh, morbidity, mortality, uh, consequences of natural um, and alarming changes in weather as well as we get to some of the, the non-natural and man-made disasters that, uh, that have occurred over past years and decades and, and threaten to continue. And the next slide, please. So the exposure and effective age is really at uh, two levels. First, it's, it's got to do with the cumulative effect of exposures across the lifespan. Lifespan is something that Rick emphasized too and clearly important to us. So, uh, the ability to be able to monitor exposures and understand how over time they lead to uh, epigenetic and other changes that are, that are detectable in individuals is critically important. Uh, and this history of prior exposure then determines some differentials potentially in the response to acute insults and exposures. So for both of these dimensions, studying of acute events and their outcomes, as well as the critical importance of longitudinal studies, uh, NIA is very much uh, enthusiastic as a participant in the overall emphasis on exposome and the intersection, as Gary put it, of the volitional and non-volitional aspects of exposures. Uh, so uh, social economic status at the time of an event, as well as during the lifespan are important, uh, determining the resilience economically and, and uh, financially at the individual level, uh, disease burden, that's a function of age and aging, the medical and social resources that are accessible during times of acute events and recovering from them. Next slide, please. So some of NIA's research priorities at the level of behavior and social research are to support and understand uh, the way in which the outcomes of older adults' health 
and their preparedness um, may be able to mitigate and provide some resilience in the face of climate change and extreme weather conditions. Uh, NIA has a long history of studying the consequences of these uh, unfortunate natural experiments and exposures uh, with I think what we've all seen are disproportionate consequences for older populations in the face of some of the most extreme natural disasters. Next slide, please. So these uh, photographs just illustrate the, the spectrum of events, natural disasters that can lead to harmful exposures uh, be it flooding, fires, uh, wind, and earthquakes, uh, all of which we've seen nationally and globally over past years. And again, where the fate of so many has uh, been reflected in adverse consequences, which are emphasized in the older adult populations. Next slide, please. Some of these examples, uh, the, uh, the exposures are, are included usual and, and natural levels, if you will, of air pollution, wildfires, hurricanes, et cetera. The exposures are to part particles of, of all sizes, uh, reactive gases, secondary pollutants, and the 180 plus hazardous pollutants on the EPA list. Next slide, please. In terms of some of the documented outcomes, these are not randomized control studies. Of course, these are observational studies, which give us clues as to the nature of consequences uh, post tragedies. I include some of those noted here. So after the Japanese tsunami, uh, cardiometabolic risk factors increased, respiratory disease, cardiometabolic disease, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and cognition in the uh, extensively studied now World Trade Center exposures, sensory visual and vestibular dysfunction after Gulf Deepwater Horizon spill, and respiratory conditions are very predominant after exposure of wildfires. Next slide, please. Some of the recent uh, NIA funded studies have found, for example, that in those uh, areas uh, where uh, older women in the US uh, have lived in regions of improved air quality, there appears to be a slower rate of cognitive decline than those who are in areas of sustained poor air quality. Uh, it's been reported in areas of China where the government has set air quality improvement targets that has been a small decline in cognitive function. Uh, it's been shown with long-term ozone exposures associated with increased cognitive impairment among older Chinese adults. And in one study, there's a combination of observation and hypothetical modeling that reduction in air pollution was associated uh, with a reduced risk of dementia in older adults living in France. Uh, these are some of the uh, examples. They need to be uh, improved upon by better longitudinal studies that are controlled by quasi-experimental methods, at least, that help us to isolate the nature of exposures. And as Rick was emphasizing, uh, the role of individual differences uh, defined by genetic, epigenetic, and other phenotypic measures so we can understand who is at greatest risk and how to address uh, the mediation of those risks and exposures. Next slide, please. So among the research interests, uh, looking to the future that NIH has its high priorities, uh, looking at the way in which exposure to air pollution, heat, wildfires, and others uh, affect well-being in midlife and later life, so the acute and again long-term result of those exposures, the impact of age-related changes in social and cognitive factors, the social determinants of health, which intersect with some of the uh, other uh, aspects of the exposome, uh, how individuals uh, maintain and make behavior change that uh, will reduce risk of exposure and mitigate recovery from exposure, and the contribution of uh, extreme weather events and some very interesting uh, opportunities uh, to study in wild natural habitat of non-human primates, in particular, uh, the exposures of these populations to natural uh, disasters. Uh, some very exciting work in, in those areas that can control and allow longitudinal studies in a way that uh, can supplement and complement what we do in, in human studies. Next slide, please. The impact of extreme weather events in particular on individuals with dementia, Alzheimer's and other forms, people living in those dementias, those who care for them are particularly uh, heartrending when we look at some of the impacts of recent natural disasters on populations, some of whom are institutionalized, some living at home with very much compromised ability to respond uh, to these events and threats. 
uh, the impacts of internal migration, change in environments, displacement on social structures, and how this affects individuals as they move into older ages of adult life. Next, please. And just final uh, uh, an offer and uh, request to all of you to please uh, stay in touch and help us stay in touch at NIA with the missions of all of you. Uh, happy to be addressing questions you might have in a constant and ongoing way. And uh, with this, let me close and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this very important study and workshop. Thank you, Dr. Hodes. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Shannon Zink, the director of the National Institute of Nursing Research. Uh, she comes from the University of Illinois at Chicago, just starting in 2020, so a relatively uh, young director of one of the United Institutes. And I, I've worked with several people uh, in, in schools of nursing, and I've noticed over the years that NINR has been very much an early adopter of things like microbiome and exposome sort of things. And I think it comes mainly from the, the profession of nursing, understanding the holistic nature of health. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. Zink has to say. Dr. Zink. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you see my slides and appreciate this opportunity to join the panel. Uh, and I'm honored to represent NIH with my colleagues, Rick, Richard, and Gary, and to share my perspective on the connections between nursing science and the environmental health sciences. So first, let me tell you um, a little bit about my perspective on environmental health. Um, I see environmental health as crucial from a social justice perspective to achieving health equity. And it's, um, I see it as really closely connected to the social determinants of health, uh, which as we know, are the conditions in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, and age uh, that affect health and quality of life. Um, so from this perspective, I am drawn to APHA's description of environmental health as focusing on the relationships between people and their environment to promote human health and well-being and foster healthy and safe communities. So whether it's understanding the health impacts of climate change, promoting healthy community design through the built environment, or improving the quality of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat, nursing research builds on a long tradition of considering environmental and social factors that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. So let me give you some context um, on nursing's history and recognizing, of recognizing and addressing the connections between social and environmental factors uh, and living conditions. I'm sorry, uh, the connections between uh, social and environmental factors and health. So nursing's earliest pioneers recognize that health must be considered within the realities of people's lives and living conditions. In other words, they were among the earliest to incorporate social and environmental factors into their solutions to health problems. Florence Nightingale was one of the first to recognize and address the connection between health and environmental elements, such as ventilation and warming, clean air and water, noise pollution, and provision of light. Lillian Wald saw nurses as working at the intersection of medicine and society to care for individuals, families, and communities in the context of social, economic, and industrial conditions. And we continue to build on this rich history through nurse-led efforts to address intensifying health inequities. In fact, the recent Future of Nursing report from the National Academy of Medicine and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation makes a compelling case for nurses to assume leading roles in eliminating persistent health inequities in our society. We couldn't agree more at NINR. Specifically, the report focuses on the role of nurses in addressing the social determinants of health, um, acknowledges that environmental hazards and natural disasters disproportionately impact low-income communities and those populated by people of color, and explicitly addresses climate change as a looming public health threat. NINR-funded research is critical in generating the evidence needed for nursing interventions that address these pressing health challenges. So in defining NINR's mission, we recognize the importance of solving 
our nation's most pressing health challenges by supporting research to inform practices and policies that will advance health equity. And one of the most important factors that influences health equity is the environment into which people are born and live. Still, the impacts of historic and contemporary racist policies like neighborhood redlining that discouraged investment in non-white neighborhoods influence too often the conditions in which we live. We can't ignore the fact that there are communities that through no fault of their own, lack the resources needed to live their healthiest lives. Nor can we ignore the fact that uh, the most vulnerable among us will disproportionately experience the effects of climate change. In the US, uh, people of color and those living in poverty are far, far more likely than their white and socioeconomically advantaged counterparts to live in areas affected by so-called urban heat islands. This is something we're examining in my own lab as we're in the process of developing a new line of research to investigate multi-level determinants of and disparities in personal heat exposure and the implications for individual cardiometabolic health. To ensure uh, that all of our funded research supports our mission, NINR developed these guiding principles for the qualities that all NINR supported work should have going forward. In considering awards for funding, the extent to which studies reflect these principles will be a factor in our decision. So we need to support research that's innovative, applies rigorous research methods, has the potential for significant impact on health and wellness uh, beyond the initial study sample, advances equity, diversity, and inclusion, addresses today's challenges, and helps us be better prepared for the future, and provides solutions to optimize health across clinical, community, and policy settings. Furthermore, the framework uh, for our next strategic plan, uh, which will be released soon, uh, includes five research lenses that describe broad perspectives by which to examine health challenges. So let me explain by what we mean by a research lens. The field of nursing science is comprised of many perspectives on what topics nursing science should address and how we should do so. Simply put, when we say a lens, we're describing a perspective through which to examine an identified health challenge. We think uh, these lenses best leverage the strengths of nursing science to innovate, think bigger, and greatly increase our impact. So as you can see, social determinants of health is among these lenses, and I believe that environmental factors could be considered under that lens and even under all the lenses. Because social and environmental factors impact so many facets of our health and well-being, we believe it's vital to support research that will examine them and identify effective approaches to address them. So we're committed to collaborating with partners within NIH and across the federal government on social and environmental determinants of health and health equity efforts. These partnerships are crucial to achieving the missions of NINR and NIH and advancing research that aligns with our strategic plan. For example, I'm excited to share with you um, about two common fund programs to advance health equity at NIH that are squarely focused on social and environmental determinants of health. So um, as background, common fund programs address emerging scientific opportunities and pressing challenges in biomedical research that no single NIH institute or center can address on its own, but are of high priority for the NIH as a whole. The Common Fund is thus a unique resource at NIH where high risk innovative endeavors with the potential for extraordinary impact are supported. So launched in 2021, the first Common Fund program was the transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity Common Fund program. This program is supporting innovative translational research projects addressing social determinants of health to prevent, reduce, and eliminate health disparities and advance health equity. So recognizing though the urgency of health equity research, we also launched a second new 10-year, $397 million common fund program called COMPASS. 
Compass will be transformative, we believe, and help us make real progress in eliminating health inequities and achieving health equity by looking upstream at the systems and structures that are causing socially and economically disadvantaged populations to become sick in the first place. The program has two overarching goals. First, the program will facilitate and implement an NIH-wide framework for health equity intervention research. Second, it will deploy and evaluate community-driven structural health equity interventions that leverage intersectoral partnerships. And I'm also pleased to let you know about a new NIH-wide Social Determinants of Health Research Coordinating Committee that was launched with NIA, NIEHS, and others. Uh, the goal of this new research coordinating committee is to accelerate research across NIH on social determinants of health across diseases and conditions, populations, and stages of the life course. In addition uh, to NINR's contributions to uh, these NIH initiatives and committees, among others, focused on social and environmental determinants of health, were also represented on HHS and government-wide initiatives. These include the Social Determinants of Health Interagency Policy Committee, and were contributing, for example, to the Climate Change, Food Systems, and Nutrition Security Working Group of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. So I'm very excited uh, to be representing um, for NINR to be representing NIH in um, many of these committees. So as I close, um, I'd just like to share a few additional thoughts on the importance of nursing research to the health and well-being. As, as you know, nurses are everywhere in our hospitals and clinics, in our schools and workplaces, in homes and justice settings, and throughout our communities. We approach prevention, treatment, and care holistically and in context. And the scope of our practice and our discipline extends from improving the health of individuals to that of entire populations. So what sets NINR apart is that our research is focused on health solutions for people in the context of their lives and living conditions. And it's that perspective that makes our scientific discipline so well positioned to lead research focused on the whole picture of health from the biology of a person's cells and genes to their whole self, their family and resources, and the environment, community, and society in which they live. So thanks again for inviting me to share nursing science's perspective on how the environment in all its forms influences health and health disparities. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Zink. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Gary Ellison from the National Cancer Institute. He is the chief of the environmental epidemiology branch. Uh, his own research is in uh, cancer epidemiology of, of prostate cancer. And he's just a, an excellent person to be speaking here because he has a great relationship with NIHS. Um, he's ex officio on council, but he actually served as acting director of the Division of Extramural Research and Training at NIHS during the recent transition. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Ellison. Okay, great. Um, so first, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to participate as a panelist during this workshop. Uh, it's great to be here with my colleagues and envision how we can collaborate and leverage resources to improve health. So NCI has enjoyed a longstanding and rich collaboration with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences on matters of the environment and cancer. And I'm reminded of the first project that I had the opportunity to work on. Um, it was the NIEHS National Cancer Institute Breast Cancer and Environment Research Program, which was transdisciplinary and included basic scientists, epidemiologists, clinical scientists, behavioral and communication scientists, and community advocates. And it focused on environmental factors and, and breast cancer. Now, this review demonstrates the emerging science from epidemiologic and mechanistic studies that point to the influence of environmental chemicals on breast cancer risk and how this risk might be greater during several windows of susceptibility, including prenatal development, puberty, 
pregnancy and menopausal transition. So from this, effective prevention efforts could occur at each point during these specific windows. And these discoveries, I don't think would have been, uh, would have been difficult to achieve with a single discipline doing the work. So today, what I'd like to cover is um, talk a little bit about the cancer control continuum as a framework for, for guiding our efforts at uh, NCI. Uh, the challenges and opportunities for studying the environment and cancer, and also new opportunities to integrate environmental health sciences into our cancer epidemiology work. So first, what is cancer control? So cancer control is essentially reducing the uh, burden from cancer. And the cancer control continuum shown here has been used to describe the stages from etiology to survivorship and end of life with several cross-cutting uh, areas like health disparities. It's useful framework for, to identify research gaps, plan, review progress, and priorities. And most of my focus today will be on uh, the, the, the lower end of this, the etiology and, and prevention. But I strongly believe that there is opportunity to explore how the environment affects cancer control throughout this continuum. For example, we've heard about climate change and how it poses an imminent threat to, to human health. And it's imperative that we understand where and how its impact can be realized so that efforts to adapt and mitigate its effects can be undertaken. So Hyatt and Baylor demonstrates how climate change can affect cancer control along the continuum from etiology with its effects on cancer risk factors through disruptions to all aspects of cancer care delivery. And, and we can see that climate change through wildfires and hurricanes has already increased the risk of uh, developing cancer and other chronic diseases through you know, its emission of you know, uh, these chemical toxicants and uh, ultraviolet ra radiation, et cetera. So along with our partners at NIH, and Dr. Wojcik talked about this, NCI has formed teams to tackle this very important issue. So a cancer occurs through the interplay of genes and the environment, and it's molecularly heterogeneous. It isn't just one disease, but many. And adding to its complexity within the same tumor type, like breast, for example, there are several molecular subtypes having potentially different etiologies. And age is the strongest risk factor for cancer. And latency of cancer makes it really difficult to study with respect to the environment. And the environment is also complex, broad and dynamic, making its measurement challenging. There have been major advances in measuring the environment that include improvements in geospatial tools like remote sensing, global positioning technologies, personal monitoring tools, including wearable sensors and smartphones, and also new assays and advances in targeted and untargeted analysis to help us understand the body bird of environmental chemicals and biological responses to it. So take it together, these tools can help us more accurately predict individual exposures and their impact on um, health and disease. However, the timing of exposure could be important, as I've mentioned before in my first slide, uh, and have lifelong consequences uh, for risk of disease. And I think about government sanctioned racism in the form of redlining that limited black and brown people to the most undesirable neighborhoods, exposing them to many environmental contaminants. This impact could still be realized today. Now the exposome first introduced by Christopher Wilde in 2005 has been defined as the totality of environmental exposures throughout the life course. And this concept moves us beyond, as you've heard earlier, the notion of assessing the impact of one exposure at a time and considers multiple external and internal exposures that in, in, can impact disease risk. And this is an opportunity for us.
So the challenge would be in collecting, managing, and integrating this environmental phenotypic and biological data and incorporating them in models of disease risk. And it really underscores the need for a collaborative approaches that include interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary designs. So population-based cohorts have many advantages for the integration of multiple types of data. Chief among the advantages is that they are well characterized with pre-diagnostic measurements of lifestyle behaviors, some environmental exposures, biospecimens, and many are geocoded. And I wanna spend the next few minutes talking about existing resources and new initiatives supported by NCI that could be used to foster transdisciplinary collaborations with a focus on health equity. For example, the NCI Consortium is a partnership to address the need for large scale collaborations to pool data and biospecimens necessary to conduct a wide range of cancer study. It includes 61 high quality large cohorts, each having 10,000 or more study participants. It represents diverse populations from at least 15 countries and four continents. It has extensive risk factor data that are available for more than 7 million study participants. And it has biospecimens, including germline DNA collected at baseline that are available for more than 2 million study participants. On the right is the racial and ethnic distribution of the cancer epidemiology cohorts supported by NCI. Now these funded cohorts include about 1.1 million individuals that are largely white and it's an aging population. So information about these cohorts, uh, including enrollment, cancer counts and biospecimens can be found using the cancer epidemiology descriptive cohort database, which is on uh, NCI's website. I've included in one of the slides at the end of this talk. So for many years, NCI has provided support to maintain the infrastructure of several risk and survivor cohorts. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that a new program announcement ju just released this month seeks to support hypothesis-based research using data from established cohorts. Highly encouraged are research questions that include understudied populations. Uh, Joanne Elena is the scientific contact for, for this initiative. And while some resources exist, we recognize the need to build the next generation of population-based cancer epidemiology cohorts that will exploit emerging and unique exposures in relation to cancer risk and outcomes, and will have understudied populations as one of the primary areas of focus. An important requirement is the addition of community partners who could inform research questions and contribute to dissemination of results. And because it encouraged, it, this initiative encourages methodological studies, I see this funding initiative as an outstanding resource to integrate emerging technological advances in exposure assessment into population-based cohort. Tram Cam Lam is the scientific cohort. And these two new funding opportunity announcements will have multiple submissions with the first application due date on July 29th, 2022. And I do want to let you all know, and I know that it somewhat overlaps with this meeting, that there will be uh, a, a, a webinar um, to discuss these two funding opportunity announcements at one o'clock this afternoon. So NCI and NIEHS recently funded five new cancer epidemiology cohorts to enable evaluation of emergent and important environmental exposures on cancer risk. And these cohorts are racially ethnic and ethnically diverse. They'll collect data on a wide variety of exposures and because of cancer's long latency, will consider intermediate factors like association between environmental exposures and biomarkers that have been described as uh, key characteristics of carcinogens. They also include community engagement to inform and enhance research in communities and a coordinating center, Dr. Malecki is a PI there that will identify common themes across the cohorts and will facilitate collaborations, explore emerging scientific opportunities and promote team science. 
Collectively, these cohorts will include close to 200,000 participants. So we, we know that people living in persistent poverty areas have a higher disease burden and its effects have not been fully investigated. And these areas are largely minority, have more children under the age of 18, making them uh, quite vulnerable um, to the conditions in those areas. Uh, these areas also experience environmental degrada degradation and, and face structural racism. So a new funding opportunity announcement seeks to fund specialized centers aimed at supporting transdisciplinary teams focused on the cancer experiences in persistent poverty areas. Uh, applications for this are due July 6th. So I just discussed three new emerging funding opportunity announcements where we can begin to think about integrating environmental health sciences and form teams that are necessary to, to carry out uh, the science. And then one more thing I want to highlight is uh, the HERE initiative. This is led by NIEHS. This provides analysis of environmental chemicals and metabolites for investigators interested in adding environmental exposures uh, to their analysis uh, um, or, uh, in their research. NCI is participating in this initiative and we can leverage this resource to to incorporate uh, more environmental health sciences into the studies that uh, we support. So in summary, um, through my experience uh, with the Breast Cancer and Environment Research Program, um, you know, I believe that transdisciplinary science can help accelerate the pace of scientific discovery. Uh, formation of groups and development of collaborations take time. Uh, different uh, investigators from different disciplines have to learn the language of the other, and that can be quite challenging. There are several existing and new resources available to integrate multiple types of data and foster collaboration. And then there are opportunities to go beyond etiology and prevention to understand the impact of environment on cancer survivors. And I also see an opportunity for NCI to continue its collaboration, not only with NIEHS, but with the other partners on this panel, as well as other ICs within NIH. And so with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your time. Um, and I'll turn it over to Gary. So now we will open it up uh, to questions. We've had questions coming in on the Q&A. You can please continue to send those in. Um, I want to start with this question about uh, what to do next. I mean, so from an NIH perspective, uh, we often think about therapeutics and drug interventions. Um, and it may be that the mitigation of some of the effects of exposures could have that sort of medical intervention. But the prevention of those exposures really falls more into the sort of public health or regulatory agencies like CDC or an EPA. Do you, this is kind of for all the panelists, do we have a sufficient level of dialogue among these agencies and what could be done to strengthen those connections to improve decision-making? Anyone just jump right in. Well, maybe I can start if that's okay, Richard and Shannon and Gary. Uh, I, I think one of the first things we can do is just bring greater awareness to the, uh, the general public of the importance of these environmental exposures and greater awareness of the importance of the environmental exposures as we study the etiology of human disease. So many of my colleagues, uh, I'm a geneticist, so I can actually point to a number of geneticists. Um, they study the, the connection between you know, allelic variants on genomes and the development of the neurological disorders, uh, a number of other things, uh, cancer. Uh, but just becoming more conscious of the role of environmental exposures and then having a, a broad-based initiative to get this information out into the general population so that people are more conscious of, um, you know, what do you do on those uh, bad air days? And what do you do about uh, potential 
exposures within your home environment. So just increasing awareness, I think is a very important first step. Okay, other comments? Well, I, I think um, NIH, as others, are recognizing um, solutions, and we need evidence um, to inform solutions at multiple levels. And, and certainly, that involves collaborating uh, across agencies in the federal government, but as well as across sectors. And I think um, some of the new initiatives being developed at NIH, uh, we mentioned a couple of common fund programs, really recognize uh, the need for a broader perspectives on um, what solutions are needed and partnering in multiple ways uh, to get there. Okay. Yeah, and I'd like to con I contribute to that as well. I, I think that it's, it's uh, increasingly, um, uh, our awareness has increased that we do need to partner with um, other organizations outside of NIH. And I'd like to highlight uh, a particular collaboration that NCI has with the Center for Disease Control, whose team has done an outstanding job of conducting workshops and seminars focused on cancer prevention based on what is known about the exposures across the life course. So it's taking the work that we've done and uh, our partners in the extramural, extramural community have done and discovering what the risks are and taking that and applying it uh, so that we can develop effective interventions. Okay. Dr. Hodges? I'd re reinforce all that's been said. You know, it, it, the, the, the role for us at NIH is to identify the questions, conduct research, to uh, focus on problems and ideally on strategies that have the potential to address them and then to uh, partner with other agencies as necessary. As, as the Shannon has, has particularly emphasized, some of the interventions we're talking about are not those that are carried out by research investigators in isolation, but require the other agencies and, and the advocacy groups uh, that need to be a part of the solution. But uh, for us, I think the focus has to be on, on identifying the problems and uh, tenable approaches to them in, involving affected populations and involving the agencies that are going to be, have to be a part of the interventions themselves. I think it is critical, too, is that the agencies have different needs. Like we, we tend to know what data to provide a drug company to develop a therapy. But when you think about a, a public health intervention, you still need to do those trials to show that they work. And it just it really kind of changes the, the tenor of how we do some of these things. So one of the things that came up with, with various comments was the it seemed that there were some tools that people would like to have, like some technologies or abilities. And because we're thinking about the future of environmental health, if we can not think so much about feasibility, but if just in kind of a dream world, what sort of tools would you want to get a better analysis of the environmental drivers of disease? Well, again, maybe I can just reinforce the points that I was making during my presentation. And Gary, I know that this is near and dear to your heart is you know, better understanding the totality of exposures. What are, what are the tools that the environmental health sciences community needs to do an exposomics experiment? And then how do we get this information out there? And how do we develop the, 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 you know, the data repositories where people will then integrate this data into you know, these repositories for the benefit of the global environmental health sciences, well, the global biomedical community. It's not just about environmental health sciences. And if you ask about the, the, the dream solution, I guess it, it can occur at two levels. The first is, is actually monitoring longitudinally the exposures directly. But the other dream, I suppose, is to try to identify the, the signatures in individuals, uh, epigenetic in the broadest sense, that can be the documentation of their exposures and take advantage of that uh, a step even better than what's actually out there in the air or water, but the impact has had on individuals. Yeah, and I would add to that. I, I think that you know monitoring the exposure of uh, individuals over time is important. Incorporating these new advances that um, I mentioned in my talk, like uh, the geospatial approaches, um, new methods for measuring and analyzing environmental uh, chemicals, incorporating in them into our large longitudinal studies and um, assessing uh, the methodological issues uh, associated with that. I think that that's 
you know, something that we haven't done so much, particularly in our cancer epidemiology studies. And I think that's a, an important thing to do. And why is that? Why haven't we done that, Dr. Ellison? I think, you know, now is the time for us to do that. I think that, you know, the different folks need to come together and begin to talk to each other, understand where the resources are available so that we can begin to, to do those things. And I think that this workshop is an important step in, in doing that, um, sharing the resources that I mentioned today that are uh, available and, and ready to uh, begin to look at some of these things in our cohorts and understand what the methodological considerations are. Okay. Dr. Zink? Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce from my own research. Um, uh, I know trying to measure environmental exposures as well as behaviors, we don't have the technologies or the tools that are um, ease burden on participants. So we'll have an accelerometer and a GPS unit and an air quality monitor and all, you know, they're wearing like 10 pieces of equipment. So trying to uh, streamline our data collection approaches uh, requires some additional technological solutions um, to, uh, to our research, I think. Yeah, it is interesting to think about the various monitors we've had over the years and from Fitbits to Apple Watches, I'm wearing one of these rings now. I mean, we have made it easier, uh, but getting those into research quality uh, is, is another step. And so I think there's definitely a need to develop um, more of that technology. Uh, so one of the- Brian, If I could just add, uh, I think one of the, it's Richard alluded to this, some of those developmental exposures. I mean, I sure would like to know what my mother was exposed to uh, during in my field development. And so looking at those epigenetic markers, um, and I think we're, we're beginning to understand, I know you're, you're very well aware of this, that there are some of those epigenetic changes during development can actually persist uh, much later in life. So better understanding those developmental changes in the epigenome, and that may be influencing you know, health outcomes uh, later in life, you know, the DOHAT um, and the developmental origins of disease. We, we, we need to be thinking about um, you know, better tools that we could be using for those purposes and, and thinking about how we might bring some of those epigenetic uh, tools uh, that are you know, emerging and that are available and using them for developmental studies. Okay. Um, a question that came in from the, the audience was, how can investigators capitalize on these expanded relationships across the NIH institutes to advance the integration of environmental health sciences in the future? Like how, how, what, what do the investigators need to do to make some of these things happen? I would just turn it around a bit and, and uh, point the responsibility on those of us at NIH to provide a focus, a nidus, so that it, it, it is not uh, left to the creativity of each investigator to figure out how, how they take advantage of uh, interactions and commonalities across the institute. So for those institutes here, those are the larger group that are a part of an initiative like this. It, it ought to be the case. It's our responsibility to make it the case. Then when there's an inquiry by an investigator with an interest that the program officer, the staff at any of our institutes can be responding and facilitating that uh, by communication across all institutes. So uh, I, I, I think the burden needs to be very much on us, not left each investigator to figure out how to make the connections. Yeah, Gary, if I could just reinforce Richard's comments, I, I think the burden is on us. And I think the good news is that, um, you know, many of the IC directors across the NIH are recognizing the importance of developing these collaborative partnerships. And I thank uh, Shannon and Richard and Gary for you know, being at this meeting today. Uh, so we can continue to work on this. I think a great success story that we've reached recently, where we're still involved in this, is the whole RADx program around the reaching out to underserved populations. And we had an update this morning on some of the just the remarkable inventions and things that have happened uh, uh, in the whole development of testing tools for COVID-19. And this wasn't one IC uh, that stepped forward. Uh, of course, NIBIB and Bruce Steinberg was a major part of this. But I think it was a really remarkable how the, the NIH blurred the lines between institutes and came up with uh, collaborative programs that um, 
that could really address a major public health uh, issue. And do, does it take a pandemic to do that though? I mean, that it's, it's a great illustration of that, but don't we have other major problems like Alzheimer's disease and cancer and, and you know, health inequities that could benefit from that? Is it something, do you, do you feel that NIH writ large uh, is, sees that, like sees that value of coming together as it did around COVID? Like, do they wanna now apply that to other problems? Somewhat, somewhat, I'd say. So, Bing, um, for one of the examples you mentioned around uh, Alzheimer's disease, as we saw the enormous increase in resources and scientific opportunities, an example of, of the things we've done to try to uh, and encourage cooperation across the, all of NIH is, is to establish a program. I hope many of those listening will understand where for um, any of the grantees, for any of the institutes at NIH who are doing research that is not Alzheimer's research, that using the funds we have available, we at NIA will, will fully pay for administrative supplements to their non-Alzheimer's research that brings their vision, their technologies, their approach to the field. And I, and I think one can imagine um, the need for similar strategies to have people who are focused in one area of research, in this case, uh, around, around exposures, exposed zone, um, and uh, natural disasters, and, and, and ask if there's a similar way, and, and I think you know, Rick can speak to this already actively, to, to support supplements, for example, to investigators not, not within the field now to make it easier to bring their disciplines and their perspectives. That's a generalization I'd make. It happened around COVID, but it's more generally true in many of our issues. We're realizing that bringing in not just more resources for the people in the field, but, but new and different perspectives more broadly is going to be a critical part for making this work best. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I'm, I can speak a little bit more, but I think Shannon and Gary probably want to say something about this too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, something that Shannon mentioned, um, in, NIH has a framework to um, have the ICs coalesce around scientific topics, and that's the common fund. Um, also, you know, Rick, with your work and the other uh, IC directors around climate change, we're galvanizing around that issue, um, bringing all of our resources to bear to, to tackle uh, that very important question. But I do want to go back to uh, one of the questions that uh, was raised around um, the onus being on uh, NIH to uh, put together these partnerships, and I, I agree with that. It's also important that we stay engaged with the extramural community, and we always encourage um, investigators who are working in the field to stay in touch with us. We'd like to know what they're thinking, what their ideas are, and given the resources that we have, uh, at our institution, we can better think about how we can go about uh, creating these co collaborations, creating opportunities for us to have this uh, transdisciplinary collaborative research. I, I actually was going to tip it back to Rick a little bit about the climate change initiative as an example. Um, but I think a lot of the examples we've given shows that NIH is trying to do better in terms of our collaboration. Um, for example, the Social Determinants of Health Research Coordinating Committee really coming together and having an intellectual space to coordinate and talk about how we can better collaborate to accelerate and advance science. Uh, we see even initiatives um, with funding going to individual uh, ICs. There's more collaboration, so maternal mortality as one example. And then Rick has, you know, really reached out to involve other ICs uh, related to climate change. So I'll uh, pass it over to you, Rick. Well, and, and Shannon, I'll pass it back to you as a great example of the leadership that you're taking to bring the NIH as a whole together around the social determinants of health. And Richard, I know that you've been very actively involved in the blueprint. I think that's another example of how it's not just uh, NIA or the neuroscience institutes working. It's really about bringing different uh, institutes of the NIH to develop plans and how we can be working more collaboratively together. And there are other, the, the All of Us program is not just about some program in the, in the OD, it's about reaching out to all of the ICs. So actually, and to be honest, part of the reason why I threw my hat in the ring to become the director of NIHS 
is that I'm seeing emerging this collaborative um, approach to doing science, blurring the lines between individual ICs, and then uh, yeah, doing collaborative, collaborative work that really uh, enhances our ability to really get to fundamental mechanisms of health and disease. So I don't know, Richard, do you want to elaborate more on the whole blueprint program? And actually, I also want to take my hat off to you and your willingness to actually share the resources that have come into the National Institute of Aging around Alzheimer's. Uh, you have been a, just a terrific partner in, in making resources available, as you alluded to, uh, to say some of the grantees at NIEHS. So you've been a, a terrific collaborative partner. Well, thank you. It's been, it's been a joy and necessity. And when you think about it, really the, the only responsible way uh, to carry out uh, our, our mission. Uh, uh, blueprint, uh, I don't know that if everyone is aware, this is the, the neuroscience blueprint at, uh, at NIH, which is um, a, a group that came together with a very small investment some years ago in which all of the institutes, and it's most of the institutes with a substantial neuroscience investment, uh, together will look at areas of research ranging from training to health disparities, uh, to new technologic approaches, to, to look for commonalities. And as, as Rick is alluding to, I think it's just one of the many examples of cross institute groups that allow us to, to communicate. Uh, it's, it's one of the great aspects, one of the great privileges of being at NIH these days is the ability to participate across institutes with, with, with leadership and so many talented people. And uh, and uh, we, we, we need your input constantly on uh, we're in addition to patting ourselves on the back at how well we're doing in some areas, the places where um, maybe you've got ideas about uh, where communication across institutes, the uh, ease of using the longitudinal studies that each of our institutes has been supporting to more generally serve multiple purposes, something we try to do, but always welcome the, the, the wisdom and input from the, the research community. So uh, hopefully it doesn't matter which one of us you contact, the message will get through to the group of us and, and don't... Don't, don't be don't be bashful. We really want and need that kind of advice. And I'll put in a plug in for those uh, exposomics workshops that are happening. This is not just an NIEHS, but it's really broad based across the uh, biomedical sciences community. So uh, stay tuned. You'll be hearing more of the details on that um, hopefully soon. There, there was a question about that, and that's exactly right. It's still in the planning phase, but the idea is there'll be a series of virtual workshops over the summer leading up to that in-person one in September, but it'll be something that'll be accessible to all and we hope that many people participate. Um, so another comment that came up here was around uh, grant review or reviews and the role of reviewers. And you know, I've, I've been involved in many applications and reviews and study sections, and we know that the, the minority voices uh, in a study section don't usually do well. And if you're starting to bring the environment into areas that have been dominated by genetics, uh, it makes it very hard to get a foothold in those more uh, unique areas. And just one of the things, like I was just thinking to myself when that question came in was, if you looked at all of the study sections and looked at the relative representation of people with environmental health expertise, I suspect it's lower than we'd want. Any comments on that? Well, maybe I can start out uh, by circling back to the comments that I made at the beginning of this Q&A. It's about education and just awareness of the role of the environment. And I, I think that there's just increasing awareness now that, you know, sequence, and again, speaking as a geneticist, I've, I've been a big proponent of sequencing genomes and identifying those sequence variants and identifying potentially somatic mutations that arise in cancer. Uh, but it's, it's better understanding the role of the environment to actually trigger some of those mutations or trigger some of the, you know, the biological interventions that can lead to adverse health effects. So just increasing awareness. And I, I think we're seeing that, um, you know, some of the National Academy meetings over the last, last couple of years. You know, there's a National Academy meeting on the role of the environment in mental health, a National Academy meeting on the role of the environment in neurological diseases. So. I mean, for example, with neurological diseases, you know, Walter Korshitz is and has been talking with me uh, with great regularity. I think you're aware of this, Gary, and uh, it's and I think Walter understands that there is a role for the environment, and we we need to better understand. And the way to do it is not to create an environmental office within 
NINDS and that works exclusively, it's really to partner with NIEHS and other ICs to really take on the bigger challenges of studying the role of the environment. So I don't know how, if I... How do you get the, the sort of input from the NIH leadership from that institute side down to the Center for Scientific Review? Yeah, because now it's it's a different situation than it was when you used to you used to house them within your own institute. Is if that's a signal to get more of the social and environmental determinants of health, how do we get CSR to respond to that? So, so I like to comment on that. I I, I think that um, CSR is um, really responding to that right now. Um, I, I just want to make everyone aware that. They've been conducting a, um, an evaluation of their study section, and it's called the Evaluating Panel Quality and Review, recognizing that science is changing rapidly, and they want to make sure that the study sections also change with the science. And this uh, review included folks from the extramural community, but also the, um, the uh, uh, community of program staff within NIH, and they evaluated the, the current study sections and proposed new study sections. And one of those study sections is the social and environmental determinants of health. So I, I think that they are recognizing that science is changing. There is a role for uh, the environment that hasn't been the primary focus of existing study sections and looking to change the such study sections in a way that represents uh, how science is conducted today. Okay. And I think that it is a challenge and you have an area and a, a particular study section that hasn't been working that area and get, really get them to change. Um, so- Gary, if I, if I could just add, I know we have just a couple of minutes left, but I'll, I'll just add a comment that uh, you can also do what we've done in the climate change and health, be proactive. We've actually contacted CSR. We're making them avail uh, making information available about the NIH-wide uh, initiatives that are happening and discussing with them, you know, the possibility that there may be more grants coming in uh, that have a climate or the health aspects of climate change. So they've been very receptive and very willing to work with us. And I really have to point to the leadership that Gwen Coleman has brought to, to the whole climate change and health uh, program. Uh, she's she really knows how to work the the extramural the extramural community and the grant community and uh, so just you know the bottom line is being proactive and making sure that you have good communication so that people understand what's happening. Okay, um, the the last question. There's not really enough time to get to this, but I want to kind of throw it out for some people to think about. Is is the relative role of the longitudinal cohorts that we've heard quite a bit about today? And the sort of like all of us UK biobank sort of approaches is, you know, where, where will we get the most value when we're looking at the environmental drivers of certain diseases and, and health overall? I think we have time for one person to make a little comment and then we'll, we'll have to wrap it up and think about this afterwards. Anyone want to comment? If there's one, it ought to be Rick. Okay, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to comment on this. I think, and, and Gary, I think you're, you're well aware of this because you were on the, the advisory group for the All of Us program, uh, just bring, bring greater awareness. What are the environmental um, tools that we can bring to bear on a very large, uh, the All of Us program? And I think as, I think as, I think it was Shannon or Gary, you know, can mention the geospatial uh, tools. Um, those may be, you know, fine tune them and bring those to bear on the, the All of Us program. And uh, so, Okay. All right. Well, we have come to time. I want to thank all of our panelists for a very uh, enlightening conversation. We will reconvene at 1145 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, if you have any additional questions, you can send them in and we can try to get back to you uh, by posting them in the chat. Okay. Thanks a lot.